Why did Russian democracy fail after the collapse of the USSR? Everything that happened is the result of the choices you have made, and there is no one else to blame. This was your own conscious choice, which resulted in the same people coming forward to the positions of power in the post-communist period, who had led the country into this situation in the first place. The very people who only yesterday served the evil empire, who ruined things and who persecuted their own people for 75 years, they have suddenly turned and declared themselves Democrats, despite the fact that everyone knows perfectly well who they are. Our society has never plucked up the courage to stand up against the totalitarian regime and turned out to be unable to squeeze out its inner slave, neither drop by drop nor in trickles. And so, instead of resisting evil, everyone rushed to adapt to it, to arrange their own career and to somehow continue living comfortably. When the opportunity came for the country to free itself, no one knew what it meant anymore, and no one wanted to take risks. All people wanted was to proclaim one or some other former party functionary the next saviour of mankind, saviour of the fatherland, be it Gorbachev or Gaidar, Yeltsin or Yavlinsky, and at the very moment when the People's Revolution knocked on their doors in April of 1991, our society discovered that the old regime feels more comfortable than something new and unknown, and that it is less afraid of the party than it is afraid of its own people. Vladimir Bukovsky at the Revival of Russia Roundtable at the Russian Academy of Social Sciences, June 28, 1993. Democracy has never been tried out in Russia yet. There were attempts, but very timid and inconsistent attempts, and Democrats have not yet been in power. Almost all of those who were called Democrats in the early 1990s were ex-communists. True, they were disillusioned with communism, and I believe that this disillusionment was quite sincere on their part, but this has not yet made them Democrats. Moreover, they did not understand anything about the market economy. How, for example, Yegor Gaidar, who had spent his entire career working at The Communist magazine, and later in the economic department of Pravda newspaper, suddenly turned out to be a market economist and a democrat. I readily believe that he had read some books about the market economy, keeping them secret from his party bosses, but he had never lived in a country with a market economy and has no idea how it all works. Hence his ugly market reforms, his voucher privatization, which degenerated into a simple scam, as a result, in just two years, such Democrats have managed to discredit what we have been fighting for for 30 years. Vladimir Bukovsky's Elections Manifesto 2007 None of us who started the human rights movement in the 1960s integrated into the political life of modern Russia. First of all, because in order to join the builders of the new democracy, it is necessary to have gone through a definite career path party membership, career progression, to have held a position of, at least, a dean of a department of economics at some university, and then, sometime around 1991, to have quit the party and become known as a prominent Democrat. I am sure that the current Democrats will do anything in their power to prevent people like me from entering the Russian political life. Vladimir Bukovsky speaking to the representatives of the City Administration of Moscow, 1992. When ostensibly the West proclaimed the end of the Cold War and accordingly treated the countries emerging from the Soviet bloc as being democracies, there was no democracy there. The system remained. Nomenclatura remained in power. Their connections became criminal connections. They turned into big mafia. They continued to operate and slowly make their way up to the utmost power. By the year 2000, they emerged in the face of a little-known colonel of KGB. And instead of suspecting at least something, the West welcomed him as the genuine face of democracy. I wonder if they would have done the same if in 1955 a former SS man would become a Chancellor of Germany. But in this new case, the new President Bush told us that he looked into his eyes and could see his soul. That, I remember, puzzled me. How did he manage to do that? In all my numerous encounters with the KGB officers, soul is the one thing I could never find there, 
And yet, it took another 10 years for the West to realize how they are mistaken, and that this ostensible new Democrat in Moscow is just a continuation of the Soviet teaching. Nothing changed. Everything ran backwards. Vladimir Bukowski speaking at The Tragedy of Smolensk, Polish Plane Crash, International Conference, January 30, 2011, London. A society emerging from a totalitarian nightmare usually has no political or social structures capable of stabilizing it in transition, except those created by and tainted by the totalitarian system. And they are most likely to oppose the changes, thus contributing to political instability typical for all post-totalitarian countries. The new institutions, although numerous and noisy, are usually tiny and weak to the point of merely symbolic existence. They are no match for the well-entrenched, all-pervasive, mafia-like structures evolving from the old regime. They are even too small to replace the governing apparatus, and therefore the old nomenclatura remains in control of all executive functions of a presumably new democratic state. It should be remembered that what we call nomenclatura is not just an ordinary bureaucracy, but a whole stratum of the society, 18 million strong according to some estimates, with its own vested interests, its own connections with the West, its own accumulated wealth, and its own complicity in past crimes to unite its members. Its mere existence poses real threat to fragile democracy, to say nothing of its control over the executive branch of the government. Add endless ethnic conflicts, fantastic corruption, skyrocketing crime rate, general apathy of the demoralized population, and the task of transition becomes all but impossible. Also, let us not forget the less-than-friendly attitude of the West to attempts at establishing democracy in the former Soviet Union. While those who, like Gorbachev and his lot, strive to rescue the moribund communist system and equally doomed Union, were given every assistance, including financial support to the tune of $45 billion, their opponents were vilified right from the start as unpredictable, unbalanced, and dangerous. Still, I am convinced that, all these odds notwithstanding, the post-August 1991 democracy, or whatever one may call it, has had a chance of survival, and even of a reasonable success, if not for the colossal blunders made by Yeltsin and his team. Vladimir Bukovsky, Yeltsin's First Hundred Days, in Champions of Freedom, can Capitalism Cope? Free Market Freedom in the Post-Communist World Hillsdale College Press, 1994 I went to Russia in 1991 before communism collapsed, and I tried to talk to the people around Yeltsin knowing full well that it will collapse. And I've tried to persuade everyone that what we needed to do was to put this regime on trial. The regime, not the people. You don't need to imprison 18 million apparatchiks. This is not the idea. The idea was to rethink the past. To give people the chance of reassessing their own place in history, and what they did, and how they contributed to this regime. Without that, I did not believe it would ever be progressing forward. Also, it would include some kind of lustration measures, removing the nomenclatura from the positions of power. None of it was done although I've persuaded almost everyone around Yeltsin. Vladimir Bukovsky talking to David Frost, Al Jazeera, February 29, 2008.